Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We are engaged now in our study of Gibran's prophet. This is lecture 23 on good and evil. Some have argued the most controversial poem of the prophet. I mean, one of the reasons, guys, we do all these readings is so you can decide which one challenged you the most. There's no question that this one of the longer poems in the prophet is going to be building off of a number of earlier lectures, lecture 9 on joy and sorrow, lecture 13 on crime and punishment, lecture 16 on reason and passion, and all of those paradoxes. You'll remember from crime and punishment, the articulation of the God self. We're going to be back to that in this conversation as well. Um, now, I'm always <clears throat> reminded of Mortimer Adler's classic list in the Britannica series, Great Books. You'll remember on the outside cover, on the back cover, there were those great ideas, and of course good and evil is one of those central ideas. So there's no question that we're going to now dance into some pretty, what a, what, what's the language from before, heavy, heavy words. We're going to dance into some pretty deep waters here. <clears throat> but Gibran does it with such an amazing lightness of touch that I, I think we're going to have to appreciate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the assumptions here, are that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net down that left hand side is our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've been introduced uh, to our introductory comments and then I'm hopeful that you've been working with us all the way up through and including our last lecture on time. Now, no question, when you resurrect the topic of good and evil right away, you're going back to the Platonic tradition and that's obviously where he's going as well. His romanticism will be ever present here, that humans are fundamentally good, we're going to see that, and that evil is in some ways a corruption or a, a disruption in the fabric. Um, this will as well take us to St. Augustine's idea that the, the fabric is good, the hole in the fabric is the evil, and therefore it's really just an absence, and we're going to see that one here as well. Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, uh, that, that classic text, is also going to be a part of that. Um, uh, of course, you'll remember that Hamlet said there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so, is in his comment to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. But Beyond Good and Evil, that 1886 uh, text, very, very important, uh, I think, in the study here. It's all going to be about intentions. That won't shock us, hearing what we're about to read. He'll say it, you are not evil, when you are not good. Uh, and, and, and that's a fascinating line, and it's one that I hopefully you'll write down, and I'm hopeful that you'll spend a little time thinking about. In the end, of course, it's his evolutionary model as well. Everything is about growth. Everything is about growing towards, or desiring to go towards uh, the good. And I want to point out the paradoxes and the word pictures that will be a part of this study as well. Notice we'll begin with one of the elders. In other words, somebody who's lived long enough to realize that this is a complicated question of what is good and what is evil, and that's where we'll start. And one of the elders of the city said, Speak to us of good and evil, and he answered, Of the good in you I can speak, but not of the evil. Now, there's a bit of irony here, and he's drawing again on that Augustine tradition that if you think about the whole in the material, what would you say is that whole? Well, it's an absence of the material. And for Augustine, that's how he liked to think about this whole notion of, of evil. Of the good in you, we're going to have five times in this little poem, he's going to say, you are good, you are good, you are good. Um, and so he's going, to be, he's going to be emphasizing the fact that all humans are good, because all humans start out as, as children uh, inherently good. And this will be, you know, a, a very romantic view. And then after he says it this way, he'll make his argument that evil is in fact a corruption of the good. Of the good in you I can speak, but not of the evil. For what is evil, and notice now our rhetorical questions that lead to paradoxes. What is evil but good, tortured by its own hunger and thirst? Verily, when good is hungry, it seeks food, even in dark caves. And when it thirsts, it drinks, even of dead waters. In other words, the argument that Gibran will make, now again, guys, you get to decide whether you agree or disagree with this view, is that there's a constant longing in the human spirit for the good, sounding very much, of course, like Plato. That 
uh, Republic 7, the cave allegory, where those individuals are sitting in the cave chained up and they're looking at shadows on the wall thinking those shadows to be real because epistemologically they do not understand what the real is. Well, the sun, of course, is going to represent in that word picture we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net for this. The sun is, of course, going to be exemplary of what? The good, right? And so here we are using the same idea. We're always longing for it. And if we can't find it one place, we're going to look some other place, even if it's dead caves, uh, dark caves and dead waters. Of course, the dark caves is a, a, a wonderful reference. And this is the most obvious reference to Plato and to Republic and to Republic 7. And now he'll begin the first of five of these You Are Goods. Uh, and, and each section now of the poem will begin with this. You are good when you are one with yourselves. And now we're back to harmony is a form of honesty and freedom. Yet when you are not one with yourself, you are not evil. For a divided house, and then notice how he uses these word pictures, for a divided house is not a den of thieves, it's only a divided house. And of course we think about Lincoln's famous observation, borrowing from the biblical tradition, that a divided house can't stand. And then from the divided house he goes to the word picture of the ship, which we've seen a number of times already in these poems. And a ship without rudder may wander aimlessly, we think of Odysseus, among perilous isles, yet sink not to the bottom. Right? And you'll remember Tolkien says, all who wander are not lost. In other words, this notion that just because it appears that someone is evil because they are doing evil does not make them actually evil. And then he'll come back for a second, you are good. Two, you are good when you strive to give of yourself. So notice in the first one, it's you're good when you're one with yourself, harmony. In the second one, you're good when you strive to give of yourself, generosity, back to lecture six on giving. Yet you're not evil when you seek gain for yourself. For when you strive for gain, you are but a root that clings to the earth and sucks at her breast. Surely, the fruit cannot say to the root, quote, be like me, ripe and full and ever giving of your abundance, end quote. For to the fruit, giving is a need, a receiving, as receiving is a need to the root. Now this tree metaphor, again, there are many readers of this poem, especially this poem, that will say, yeah, he's dancing around some very interesting philosophic questions without giving us an idea of what he really thinks. But the point I want to make to this one is, notice that there's this symbiosis between, on the one hand, the fruit, and we've obviously seen this earlier in some of our poems, the, on the one hand, the fruit, and on the other, the root. In other words, what's he really saying? And in using the tree, obviously, we're back to Genesis 3, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all of that. And, of course, our Milton's Paradise Lost comes to mind as well. What's he really saying? All parts of the tree matter, both the fruit as well as the roots. You can't have the fruit without the roots. And in that regards, it's all symbiotic. Or it's, it's, again, integral. It's all part of it. And now to his third of the you are good. You're good when you're fully awake in your speech, and this takes us back obviously to his passage on talking at, uh, in our number 21 lecture. Obviously it takes us to our Thoreau, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake and all of that. In other words, waking up, being fully awake is, especially in your speech, evidence that you're good. Yet, you are not evil when you sleep while your tongue staggers without purpose, and even stumbling speech may strengthen a weak tongue. In other words, again, just because you don't always speak the right things doesn't mean that you are evil, he says. And quite to the contrary, it may be the case that there is some staggering, some stumbling which must take place. Don't misconstrue these as evil. And then to the fourth of the are, you are good. Notice again, he's wanting to make the point to his listeners, and I think Gibran to you, that... You have to think long and hard before you start naming people as evil just because they might do some things that appear to be evil or actually are evil or inappropriate. You are good when you walk to your goal firmly and with bold steps. We think obviously of Whitman's song of the open road, a foot and lighthearted I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. We've given full lectures 
in our talks with Walt at LearnStrong.net over all those poems and leaves of grass. You're good when you walk to your goal firmly and with bold steps, yet you're not evil when you go thither limping, notice from staggering to stumbling now to limping, even those who limp go not backward. Now I think this is the key line of the poem, and I think this is really at the heart of what Gibran is trying to argue. Everything is about evolution and progress. Even what appears to not be progress is progress because there's always within the human spirit some desire to limp forward, not backwards. But you who are strong and swift, now, and we've seen this a number of times, where he'll speak to those who would maybe have a tendency to think of themselves as being more in the good camp than the bad camp. Go back to uh, Crime and uh, Punishment, Lecture 13, to, to see where he plays this game so beautifully. But you who are strong and swift, see that you do not limp before the lame, deeming it kindness. It's a brilliant insight. In other words, the goal is to live your life well, i.e. good, but to live it with grace, especially for those who are struggling. Right? And then finally, the fifth of the you are good. You are good in countless ways, and you are not evil when you are not good, a repetition of the earlier line. You're only loitering and sluggard, Pity that the stags cannot teach swiftness to the turtles. It is, I think, a remarkable line. In other words, what is his argument? That all of us, at some point or another, are sprinting, at other times are limping, staggering. And there is nothing that the swift can give to the slow other than patience, grace. The understanding that we all come to truth in our own way and in our own time. And, of course, in the back of Gibran's mind, very possibly, is the story of that man who hangs on a cross and is put there as an innocent man by those who would want to end his life. And what is it that that man on the cross has to say about those individuals? We're obviously referencing the Luke 23, uh, 34 to 38 passage. Well, he doesn't say about them that they're evil, does he? What does he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. If they could have better, fuller knowledge, comprehension, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing now. This is a compelling Platonic insight, again, and it takes us back to the cave allegory of Republic 7, no doubt. Those individuals sitting in the cave, they, they've just not yet been shown that they're living in a cave. If you could somehow help to emancipate them, they could understand that, in fact, what they thought was real was not real. We're not saying that the shadows on the wall don't exist. They obviously exist. We're just saying they're not real in some fundamental way. Now, to finish this little poem, in your longing for your giant self lies your goodness. I love this giant self, right? Um, this takes us back to the God self of obviously crime and punishment passage. In your longing for your giant self lies your goodness, and that longing is in all of you. And there it is. That's outright, that's the romantic view, that all humans are inherently good. And a bad education or a terrible uh, uh, civilization or community or whatever, it, bad, uh, bad surroundings, the nurturing that should have attended the nature is not there. And that's why there's holes in the garment, right? But in some of you, that longing, the longing obviously for the giant self, is a torrent rushing with might to the sea, carrying the secrets of the hillsides and the songs of the forest. You could argue, those of us who would say, well, I kind of understand that. I always want to know more. I want to know more. Well, obviously, that's why we're reading poems uh, by Gibran called the prophet, right? We're excited for this kind of thing. Notice he says, and in others, this longing is a flat stream, taking us back to his argument on time, right? Stream that loses itself in angles and bends and lingers before it reaches the shore. The shore. In other words, for some of us, the longing for evolutionary progressive growth is straight. I mean, it's like a torrent. For others of us, we kind of have a tendency to meander, kind of like the Bighorn River through the Badlands, right? But let not him who longs much say to him who longs little, quote, Wherefore are you slow and halting? 
end quote. We're back, obviously, to this idea of pity that the stags can't teach swiftness to the turtles. For the truly good, ask not the naked, quote, where is your garment, nor the houseless, quote, what has befallen your house. Um, the idea that we must be patient with those who are, at the moment, less capable. Well, in this regards, what are we going to say at 2A? We're all connected in some way, no question, right? The We've got to be evolving, and a desire to be good is the essence of what it means to be a human being. And then we have to have patience. Patience with ourselves, patience with those. I said grace, patience, right? And to me, I love the repetition, the rhythms in this poem, uh, five times that you are good. At 3A, do you remember in uh, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching 27, what is it he says? What is a good man, the teacher of a bad man? What is a bad man, a good man's charge? Um, I, I like that idea, that, that notion that Gibran is, is borrowing from that Taoist tradition makes sense in this study. Finally, I, we mentioned obviously Republic 7, we mentioned Christ and his comments uh, in Luke 23, 34-38. Finally, in 3b, how about yourself? How, do you, how are you going to own a passage like this? What do you think of yourself when you think? Uh, sometimes students will say, I'm just not good enough. And we've you know, kind of deconstructed that line before. It's, it's a fun thing to do. What do you mean by enough? What do you mean? Like there's what, a standard somewhere? Show me where that standard is. I'm not good enough. Okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll get rid of the word enough. I'm not good. Really, but define what you mean by good. And at the moment that we can somehow deconstruct the silliness of using that word and saying I'm not, now we're just simply down to I am not. And of course, that's silliness as well because you exist. What is it? Whitman says that you can contribute a verse to the great drama. Of course, as we then in this study, Gibran brilliantly will say, what about prayer? Hmm, very interesting question. Thank you.